He's very excitable, so don't say anything to surprise him. Pleased to meet you. Actually, we've met once before. What? I've never done an episode of Futurama on this channel, and I've done several episodes of The Simpsons, so it would make complete sense to do one, given it's the same creators. And for a mental health channel, what better episode to cover than the one titled Insane in the Mainframe? Fry and Bender are sent to a psych hospital for robots. <laughs> Ready? Let's crack on. Futurama is brought to you by Thompson's Teeth. The only teeth strong enough to eat other teeth. Why would you want teeth that are strong enough to eat other teeth? They have all the breakfast options available. I'm no dentist, but teeth really are the second strongest substance on the planet after diamond, and that's really because of the enamel that makes them even stronger than bone. In my job as a psychiatrist, I tend to see a fair bit of teeth grinding and teeth clenching, which has a fancy medical term called bruxism. It's most commonly associated with stress, can happen during the day, can happen at night, can be really painful. And for those with untreated mental illness, bruxism is much more likely to persist. Good news, everyone. Today marks our dear friend Dr. Zoidberg's 10th year with Planet Express. Huzzahs are in order. Is he Huzzah. really a doctor? <laughs> Hooray for me. Hooray for Zoidberg. I will now read the mandatory speech. Dear employee, has it really been five 10 or 15 years? If not, please disregard this and get back to this work. This feels too real working in the NHS. In the comments below, tell me your favorite ambiguous TV doctor where you're not quite sure if they're really a doctor or not. Sorry, Zoidberg, but for me, it's Dr. Nick and Dr. Krieger. <laughs> also, yes. He's right. I've got to start investing wisely. Well, down to my last lottery ticket. Cherry. Cherry! Mule. Crud. Why do people gamble? Well, that's a question that I tackled on an episode of South Park all about freemium gaming. But in short, it's all based on learning by outcomes and how frequently those outcomes tend to come by and how predictable those outcomes are. Those behaviors that are most addictive and underpin the most common forms of gambling are a variable reinforcement schedule. The reward comes after a variable number of responses. Take slot machines. I don't know which press of the button or which pull of the lever is going to lead to the reward. I can't predict that. Just one more. Just one more. <laughs> <laughs> you old lunatic. How you been? Oh, not bad. Not bad. Everybody on the floor! This is a stick up! <laughs> well, that escalated. The word lunatic came about in around about the 13th century. It came from the Latin lunaticus, meaning moonstruck from the belief that it was changes in the phase of the moon that caused intermittent periods of insanity. Apparently, it was also the name for a scandalous hairstyle off of the late 1800s, the lunatic fringe. That's before I think Theodore Roosevelt gave that phrase a completely different meaning. And lunatic soup apparently was a term used for booze off of early 1900s. As the surveillance camera for that bank what all the judge was a-jawing about, could y'all tell us what you'd done seen the day of the crime? Well, let's see. My memory's a little fuzzy, but it went exactly like this. <gasps> Why is that bird lawyer just reminding me of Charlie on Always Sunny when he claims to be an expert in bird law? It's the first image that came into my mind. Memory in humans is not always as reliable as we would like to think. Our recall, so our ability to spontaneously search for past information on meanings or episodes in our life, worsens with time and can be biased based on our emotional state, both our emotions at the time that we stored that information and experienced it, and our emotions at the time that we're trying to recall it. The other problem is, is that we don't store a memory of every single step of everything that we do in our entire life. We store chunks of information, components, which means when we're trying to recall this, we then have to reconstruct and fill in the gaps. For example, when you recall a conversation that you had with someone, did you recall every single word that you both exchanged? Or did you just kind of store the salient topics? And then when you're trying to recall it, you fill in the gaps about what the conversation was about in more depth. Those gaps, not always accurate. And that means memory can be very, very suggestible without us always realizing. It's a big problem for eyewitness testimony in the courts because the more time that's passed, the more often quite valid questions there can be over the reliability of people's memory of what happened. 
I may be a simple country hyper chicken, but I know when we're finger licked. What do you say we plead insanity? A few months in an insane asylum? I could do that standing on my head. If you start now, it might help our case. I went through the insanity defense in, in quite a lot of detail when we watched various episodes of The Crowded Room on Apple TV. And lots of countries have some sort of insanity defense, but the actual wording of it and the content of those legal tests and legal definitions varies between jurisdictions. I obviously can give you a UK perspective, where for us, the legal test is based on the McNaughton rules. There's four, that you need to have evidence of a defect of reasoning caused by a disease of the mind that either means the person doesn't understand the nature and the quality of the act that they're said to have done, or if they did understand that, that they didn't know it was wrong, which specifically means legally wrong. Doesn't matter whether you thought you were morally right, doesn't matter whether you felt that you had no choice but to do what you did. That means the threshold is so high. It's such a specific definition, which means that most people, even with the most severe mental illness, will not reach and meet the legal test for insanity. Some would say the threshold is too high, impractically high, highlighting the lack of understanding in the law about mental illness. Some would say that. I couldn't possibly comment. Counselor, what evidence do you offer to support this new plea of insanity? Well, for one, they done hired me to represent them. Insanity plea is accepted. Mr. Bender, I hereby commit you to the Asylum for Criminally Insane Robots until such time as you are deemed cured. Yahoo! The system fails again! Hospital is not necessarily the cushy option, and in my experience, the people with the most severe mental illness, for example in prison, don't want to go to hospital, and actually a lot of prisoners have a fear of being, and I quote, nutted off. <laughs> you got to remember with hospital is that you're around lots of people that are very, very mentally ill, and there's a lot of expectation that you're going to engage in things like therapy. Therapy is really hard, but you can't just sit back, do your time, and then be released like in prison. And Mr. Fry, I sentence you to the Home for Criminally Insane Humans. Your Honor, that facility has been full ever since you ruled that being poor is a mental <laughs> illness. Order, order! The only poor people I want to hear about are the people who tend to my paws at the spa. Just send them both to the robot loony bin and let's go. Well, he's charming. <laughs> it would not be beyond the realms of possibility that in past centuries there has been some medical or diagnostic term to label the poor as mentally ill. That would be quite on brand. But do we still medicalize poverty? I, I think we do to an extent perhaps more indirectly, poverty can be a major risk factor for mental illness and mental illness can really increase the rates of poverty because, you know, a lot of people with the most severe mental illness, conditions like schizophrenia, for example, they simply can't hold down employment. Not everybody, but many of them. And try navigating the benefit system when you're living with and trying to manage a condition like schizophrenia. Then we've got the question of, well, how can you adequately treat mental illness when someone's living paycheck to paycheck, worrying about how they can pay their bills and keep a roof over their head. You can't fluoxetine your way out of that. Which brings us back to something I talk about a lot in my videos, which is that psychiatry today does, or at the very least really should, be practicing in accordance with the biopsychosocial model. So thinking about medication, talking therapy, and lifestyle social changes that all need to work in tandem to support people with a mental illness. Just focusing on one of these things won't be enough. <laughs> I know it's taking the mick, but if we think about what Walter Freeman did when he was trying to, uh, he basically was doing the lobotomy in his office and at some points in the back of a van off of the 1940s and the 1950s before antidepressant, antipsychotic medications came along. And there was a very conveyor belt mentality to how this procedure was done. For those that don't know, the lobotomy was a, a really barbaric procedure that aimed to sever the connections between a structure in the prefrontal cortex called the orbitofrontal cortex, responsible for motivation, impulsivity, and sever its connections to the thalamus, which is our main relay point in the brain, sending connections to all different parts and circuits within the brain itself. If you sever this connection, it was designed to reduce the agitation of very distressed, mentally unwell patients at a time when we had little other options available other than chemical restraint with barbiturates and physical separation from society in asylums. 
thankfully went away when we developed pretty effective medications, but it's still a, uh, a, a shadow that really hangs over our profession, I think, even today. Dr. Perceptron, I see what they did there. <laughs> and Freudian circuit analysis. I am Dr. Perceptron. Let me give you something to help you relax. The pure psychoanalysts didn't want you to be relaxed. They wanted you to be anxious. They wanted you to be uncomfortable because then that anxiety bubbles to the surface, becomes very, very evident, and that becomes the launching pad for discussion. So some use this silent start where they don't speak first and they wait for the patient or the client, whatever term you want to use, to speak first. That's why even when we had our reflective practice sessions with various psychoanalytical people, we weren't even allowed a cup of tea in the room with us because it seemed too much as a safety blanket when actually... They wanted to make us uncomfortable. It's not nice. It's effective, though. Look, there's been a terrible mistake. I'm a human being, see? I'm all squishy and flabby. Also, I complain a lot. Yes, you do. You need to relax more. Wow! Terrific. Now consider the following. You were admitted to this robot asylum. Therefore, you must be a robot. Diagnosis complete. <laughs> So he's going to say that the belief of being human is delusional. I disagree with you, therefore you must be mad. Say the definition of a delusion with me now. It's a fixed, false belief held with 100% certainty despite all evidence to the contrary. What defines a delusion is that it's false and that it's fixed and unshakable. It doesn't have to be bizarre. It often is, but it doesn't have to be. How many of you actually said that definition with me? Or at least mouthed it with me? Or thought it? I see you. I don't really see you. Please don't be paranoid when I say that. He's very excitable, so don't say anything to surprise him. Pleased to meet you. Actually, we've met once before. What? This has reminded me of a legitimate diagnosis that has just been included in the new edition of the International Classification of Diseases, so the ICD-11. It's called Intermittent Explosive Disorder. Nothing to do with exploding robots, nothing to do with combustible, sort of literally combustible humans. Emotionally, perhaps, but not physically. <laughs> It's described as an impulse control disorder characterised by these sudden, unexpected bursts of anger. People essentially explode into a rage without provocation or clear reason. I personally don't like it. I think it's a lazy diagnosis. I think it's a lazy medical rebrand of the term challenging behaviour. People behaving in a way that people don't like and becomes an excuse for people to not dig a little bit deeper and to find the inevitable triggers that are underneath and make the appropriate environmental and adaptive changes around people rather than just rushing in to sedate those emotions away. You don't have to be crazy to mutter to yourself, it, but it helps. Yeah, fair enough. I'm a pretty girl. I'm a pretty girl. I'm a pretty girl. Whoa, someone had a busy day. My roommate exploded. I mean, muttering to yourself isn't always pathological, by the way. Many of us have an internal monologue. That's normal. Fry, meet Norm. How's it going, pal? Still picking up transmissions from the CIA on your teeth? They just won't stop. The CIA cafeteria <laughs> menu for the week of May 15th is as follows. Monday, shepherd's pie. Two... <laughs> See, just because somebody is paranoid does not mean that they're wrong. Remember, delusions have to be false as well as fixed and unshakable. Change places! Bender, I can't take much more of this. I want out of here. Are you crazy? This place is great. Electroshock whenever you want it. Two Lincolns for every Napoleon. Ah. Sweet life crude. Hospital isn't always therapeutic for people. Remember, it's a ward full of other mentally unwell people, quite a strict regimen. And if we take ourselves out of the criminal justice setting for a second and we think about in the community, putting people in hospital can remove people from their protective factors. And we in psychiatry often underestimate the importance of those protective factors. We're so focused on the risk factors, the things that can make people unwell, that we really lose sight of how powerful those things can be that lift you out of those periods of mental illness and give you hope and give you purpose. Being around your friends and family, sleep in your own bed, the types of food that you eat, the structure to your day that is familiar and that really, really works for you. The two Napoleon comments does remind me of that time I worked on a ward with two Jesuses. Jesuses? Jesus I. Jesuses. Fresh translators. The doctor says you are making great strides with your exploding problem. Well, the way I see it.
I suppose all of us in mental health services and mental health professionals are gibberish translators to some degree. So I'm thinking of my patients with the most prominent thought disorder where one thought doesn't logically move into the next and it can be difficult to really keep up with the point that somebody is making. But that disorganisation in people's thoughts and then their speech does not mean that it lacks meaning and lacks meaning particularly to the patient even if that's in a completely different reality to yours. And it's a really important skill to develop is to be able to sit with that and try as best you can through that disorganisation to understand their perspective in their psychotic reality, even if it's not true reality, because that will be key to building trust and building a therapeutic relationship. Without that, it's very difficult to adequately treat people's mental illness in the long term as well as just in the acute situation. Learn to be a good gibberish translator, so to speak, rather than just dismissing it. It's a skill. <laughs> You are being released. Finally! Sweet justice! Sweet, juicy justice! Not you. Him. Oh, has he Me? stopped exploding? What a surprise! Ooh! Look! I barely exploded at all. We can control that with medication. See? Even exploding mental disorders can get better. <laughs> Genuinely, though, disorders of the mind are no different and no less treatable than disorders of any other organ system. Your friend is cured. Oh, why? Really? Um, you'll notice he no longer suffers delusions of humanity. Affirmative. Delusions of nothing. humanity is I am great. A robot. Beep. Beep, beep, beep. Which I suppose, depending on a robot's perception of what the human race is like, could be classed as either a grandiose or nihilistic delusion. I'm going to remind Fry of his humanity the way only a woman can. You're going to do his laundry? Deserved. Fry, this is for you. Beep. Oh, for God's sake! Challenging delusions doesn't work. Remember, they're fixed and they're unshakable. Probe into the intensity to which the belief is held. Is there any willingness to consider an alternative opinion? Is there any element of doubt over whether what they believe is really factually true or not? That will help you understand is it truly of delusional intensity or not? And then down the line, after you start treating, is this treatment starting to work? But don't bluntly challenge it because it won't work. The very nature of these delusions mean all it will do is cause hostility and break any trust that you're trying to otherwise build. Don't kill me yet. I'm starting to come down with Stockholm Syndrome. Anthem. Halt, fellow robot. Stockholm Syndrome, feelings of uh, trust or affection towards a captor that's usually described in a hostage situation. It's not an actual medical diagnosis, but it is a well-described phenomenon based on sort of the way that attachment can change, I suppose, between the two people. The hostage transitions from seeing the captor as a threat to having shared human qualities that they do, which makes them more relatable and builds a sense of attachment. Because even the most antisocial of human beings are still human. We have more in common than the things that we don't. Remember this idea of painting people as evil monsters is, in my opinion, nothing more than a societal defence mechanism. Help! Help! He is a battle droid! Somebody help me! Mommy! I'm sorry I spilled a transmission fluid, Mommy. No, no! Don't whelp me to the wall, Mommy! <laughs> It's an interesting example of emotional regression when we're scared or we're feeling vulnerable. Even though he's a robot, that's a very, very human thing to do. How many of us, when we're sick, kind of want someone to take care of us? We want our safe, secure attachments nearby to help us feel that everything is going to work out okay. Asking for your mum happens in medicine more often than you might think. I thought there were some interesting reflections on shared humanity between various parts of society and between the mentally ill and the not mentally ill. I always get comments on sort of my videos going, oh, you're, you're, ruining it. you're taking these cartoons too seriously. It's cartoons. It's not that deep. It's a mental health channel. The whole point is to watch these and think about what are the mental health lessons we can take from these shows and apply to our own lives. So if you like that sort of stuff, please do stick around. If you don't, that's fine. But I thought there was a lot we could take from that episode. But do let me know what you thought in the comments below and I will see you for another episode very, very soon. Love you. Bye.